Okay, let's get ready to make a painting. Let's do this. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to my studio. My name's Michael Markowski, and today we're going to recreate another painting by another one of my favorite artists. In fact, the, today's artist is an artist that I love so much that we're spending the entire week looking at their work. We're talking about Henri Matisse. And yesterday we made four paintings, two paintings of two versions of two paintings, so four in total, and that's what's under here. We're going to take a look at this one underneath here because it's been drying all night long and hopefully it turned out knock on wood. And But today we're going to make a painting that doesn't involve anything new or different. It's, we're not cutting, using tape, gluing, doing anything. We're just doing the standard painting. And this is one of my favorite Matisse paintings. This is a portrait of Matisse's daughter, Marguerite. And there's a really fascinating story that involves Picasso. So let's get right into it. If you want to do today's painting, then there is an outline that I've created just for you, which you can use to help get this image started. We're going to do today's painting about as simply as I can imagine making it for even the most beginner artist out there. Okay, so if you want to use this template, you want to download it and use it, then let's talk about how we're going to make that happen. Okay, so the first things that we're going to do, this is the 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 uh, <laughs> order of events for today. We're going to start with getting an image onto the canvas, right? So we're going to learn how to do the image transfer. I'm going to show you how that's done. Afterwards, we're going to do the imprematura, which is we're going to put a, a yellow coating on top of the painting, which is a traditional technique artists have been using for a couple for five, six hundred years. While that's drawing, we're going to talk about Matisse's biography, really just a, a small portion of it because we have all week to talk about his life. So we're just going to talk really about him, his formative early years. And then we're going to begin the painting itself probably in about 20 minutes from now, which is we're going to be doing a little bit of underpainting, a little bit of uh, like outlining with a darker color. And then we're going to paint the background. We're going to paint the foreground, the, the face of Marguerite. We're going to finish the background, then finish Marguerite herself. And that brings us to right around the finishing touches, which should be in about an hour and a half from now. And at the very end, we're going to be doing our side-by-side -side comparison. So if you're watching it for the very first time, you're certainly welcome to take a look right at the end, uh, assuming the video is has already been recorded because I'm right now live. So unless you got a time machine, that's not possible. But that would be your plan here. Also, just as a reminder to like, subscribe to the channel, hit notification bell, and then I want you to take a photograph of the artwork that you've been that you've made, whether it was. Marguerite by Matisse that you've recreated or something else that you're working on your own time upload it to the Facebook group as well if you want to make a donation here's a couple of links to help support the show and to keep it running so let's talk about uh, the this is the Facebook group I encourage everyone to join it it's sort of doubled in size over the past uh, month or so so people here's a couple of people who've already been inspired by Matisse who are already working on Matisse paintings um, and then once a month, I go through all of this artwork and give people feedback on how to make them even better. So if that's something you want to participate in, it's totally free. That's your, uh, your invitation to join us in this creative community. So here's the link to the Dropbox folder. You'll see it's one of the first links in the video description below. And you're going to see there are, I think, like 150 full subfolders in here. There's lots of paintings. These are all paintings we've already done, except for maybe 10 folders of upcoming paintings. So all of our most simple paintings are at the very top of this list. And all of the more difficult paintings are begin down below here. And some of them aren't that much more difficult. But, you know, when we learn how to paint the Mona Lisa, for instance, that might be a little bit more challenging for the most beginner artists out there. But we are right up here. One of our very, one of, closest to the very top. Here's the top. Here's where we are. Henri Matisse. 
There's a lot of images in here because we were painting Matisse all week long and many of them are very simple, straightforward paintings. So you'll see this is today's painting right in here, but sandwiched in between. And then the other ones are for tomorrow's painting and Friday's painting. Thursday's painting, however, is a little bit more complex and you'll find that Henri Matisse folder towards the end. I think it's like folder 120 or something. So once you've downloaded that, um, you've, you've clicked on, you can download this file, the original, as well as the outline, and there's a JPEG and PDF version of these outlines, whichever is easier for you to print out. I just used the inkjet printer here at my house, and I printed it out onto, uh, here, these are a bunch of upcoming paintings that I've gotten ready here. So, let's get that out. So, I'm going to show you how to do this transfer. All right, and let's cue that up. Um, come on. <laughs> Ah, technology. So I'm going to sp uh, put this over top of everything here. Uh, one day it will open. Let's go back to this while that loads up. Okay, so I'm going to play this video and then talk over top of it while that's happening. So I'm going to be using a 9 by 12 sized canvas. I, I've been using these 9 by 12 sized canvas boards for over two years to do almost 120 of these paintings. They work great. Although this one, I'm not the happiest with this brand. There are other ones that I prefer. There's uh, links in the description below for those. I take my printout uh, from the Dropbox folder and I just tape it to this canvas. And you'll notice I'm just moving it down just a little bit. Uh, I wanna make sure that if it's, uh, those words are gonna be, aren't just gonna be crushed right up at the very top, but uh, that's totally up to you. So I put my carbon paper, you can use graphite paper or carbon paper. And usually I've been using for about 180 of these paintings, been doing this with a red pencil which breaks all the time so I've decided to start using a pen finally I'm a slow learner so this makes things a little bit easier and I'll get a much thinner line as well so I'm not gonna go through this whole thing it's pretty self-explanatory just trace over all those lines and just before I lift it off I just want to make sure that everything is there sometimes I miss an eye or a nose and there you go, you peel it off. And I like to recycle the uh, this here, just in case, you know, I, I, or sorry, I mean, I like I keep it, so just in case I want to reuse it, I have that option, All right? But you could throw it in the recycling if you were, in fact, done with it. Okay, so now I've got this image on the canvas. Maybe just before we do that, let's take a look and see how yesterday's cutout that Matisse did worked, right? Because we glued it down and we put some weight on there to help um, glue it down. We just used matte medium. You see, I haven't pulled this off yet, so you're seeing it for the first time with me. And that looks pretty good. There's a few places where the glue kind of squirted out the edges and I see a little bit of uh, discoloration, not bad. But you know, again, when we talked about Matisse's uh, cutouts, we did talk about how some of them, are, they're actually much rougher looking in person than they do look on, on uh, 
in a reproduction in a book or on computer. So probably this actually looks cleaner than one of the originals. And just maybe uh, it's worth just seeing these two side by side. Let's just, uh, again, sorry for the little detour here, but we didn't get you. So this one was one that I, I hand painted. So you could see it's maybe, actually, it, you can't really see the brush strokes in it too well which may or is maybe good or bad, depending on the way you want to think about it. Whereas this is actual paper, watercolor paper that I've glued down on there. Uh, and then maybe at some other point, I'm going to maybe towards maybe today's episode or wherever, I'm going to do the same thing, transfer the signature on here, because I think that's kind of a cool little bonus bit. Okay, so let's just move those out of the way. Oh. And that was one of the other ones that we made yesterday as well. So if you wanted to learn how to do this, this is with tape that we taped off and then put that paint over top. Looks pretty cool, right? Okay. So anyway, I digress. This is the painting we're working on today. So let's get right to it. So the next step that uh, we want to do now that we've got the image transferred onto the canvas is that we want to do the imprimatura, right? So we're gonna put a yellow coat of paint on top of here. Now, you could skip this, uh, this step for sure. You're gonna get a different result than I'm gonna get, but it won't be, it won't be earth shatteringly different. It's just going to be a little bit different. And in my opinion, it, it's not going to have the same um, uh, maybe warm glow that mine will, but not everybody wants a warm glow, you know? Like So um, So I just put a little bit of water in there. That's usually the only time I ever use water when I'm making a painting, an acrylic painting because we use water for cleaning our brushes, right? So we wanna to try to avoid using it for painting as much as possible. It's got a bunch of this extra water on here. So let's apply this here. Now, traditionally artists would use a rusty red, earthy brown color to do this. Um, and so this is sort of my unique sort of take on that technique. Most for all sorts of different reasons, but one of which is it just is a lot easier to do this at the beginning of a painting than it is to mix a brown. Because we're using a very simple palette and we're going to look at the colors that I've been using to do every painting, again, including the Mona Lisa and all of the most famous paintings from relatively recent art history for, from the past couple hundred years, we can do it all with just seven tubes of paint. And maybe matte medium and glazing fluid too, if you wanna, I think those two mediums are certainly very helpful. Cool, let's let that dry. Okay. So, maybe it, I just wanna kinda of talk quickly about the paints that I'm using just to kinda of clarify for people who um, want to know exactly what we're using and when I refer to a warm or a cool color, these are the colors that I'm using. This is the brand that I use. I'm not sponsored by anyone. No one's paying me any money to use a specific brand of paint. I've just been using this brand of paint when I teach classes for about 10 years because it's, it's very accessible. Here in Canada, you can get it across the country very easily. Um, it's also relatively inexpensive. You get a lot of it bang for the buck and the quality seems to be pretty high, right? So um, these are the colors that I use, but you can 
insert all these other colors instead if you're if you've already got a bunch of paint by golden for instance or liquitex or Windsor or Newton and you can certainly go back and pause the video and take a screenshot of any of these here artist loft this is uh, Michael's art supply brand buzz art supplies Peebo Holbein and dialer Rowney so those are all the really the most w globally well-known uh, brands of acrylic paint so you should be able to find your paint in here and then choose the specific colors to get the exact effects that I'm going to be doing today. Okay, so let's talk briefly about Matisse's biography, who he was as an artist, uh, or who he was, who, the, the man that became Matisse, because he was a little bit of a late bloomer, at least uh, when we compare him to his chief rival, Pablo Picasso. So let's take a look here. So Henri Matisse, born in 1869, dies in 1954 at age 84. Born and raised in France, dies in France. And having said that, he was a quite a prolific traveler. So he did travel all over the world. He spent time in New York, in Los Angeles, which I think is, is kind of interesting because I used to live in Los Angeles to think that that he was there. We always kind of tend to think of this generation of artists as being kind of located like just in in a specific area of Paris, but but many of them did do a little bit of uh, of movement. And anyway, so let's just kind of take a look at his early biography. So Matisse was born in in northern France in, in kind of an area that borders uh, northeast of France with Belgium and his father was a, a wealthy grain man manufacturer merchant and so the family had money and with that money it was sort of understood that Matisse would go to a good school and get a good job as some sort of government bureaucrat right that that was at one point that would and for certainly some people in the world today would still consider that to be kind of a, a, a good career path. So he studied law with the idea of working in the courts as um, a court administrator, according to Wikipedia. I, rem I There's a great set of books that I read. Um, I'll have to I'll come up with the... Let's see. Henri Matisse um, book biography is it Hillary? So it's oh. So this there's this is a set of two books. I think this is the second one. So there, there there's. A, two volumes biography that this uh, uh, historian Hillary Sperling wrote about Matisse that I read I've, I've read them like three times <laughs> I'm a bit obsessed I, I went backpacking around Europe and carried both of those books with me all around Europe <laughs> which is crazy now because today you could just have them on your phone um, but that was in the day before before that and highly recommended books great books if you're interested at all in Matisse you've got to read these two books by Hilary Sperling cannot recommend them highly enough I'll put links in the video description after today's episode um, because you know Wikipedia here just gl glosses over his first 23 years of his life as and there's a whole book that the first maybe 150 pages cover what is right here in Wikipedia so um, but suffice to say so he's on this career path where he's going to become uh, a lawyer or a judge or just somebody working within the apparatus of the legal system in northern France and then he has an attack of appendicitis and you know a hundred years ago that was very serious that could have been a that was a life-threatening situation so there's a period of convalescence where he's at home you know this time he's like in his I think he's like maybe 22 or so and to kind of keep him busy his mother buys him a, a box a set of, of paints and you know canvases just to to keep his mind 
going and, and his spirits up. And Matisse calls this that moment of painting and getting into painting a kind of paradise, which I think is so beautiful because it was a way for him to kind of to travel and to explore through his imagination. He quickly gets the bug, as many of you who are watching know what that's like. He gets the bug to make start painting and he decides to, to go back to school to become an artist. And this is if he's about age 23 and which just there cause that causes ultimately a lifelong rift between him and his father. You know, which is probably not surprising, you know, if if you were to, you know, if anyone who is in their early 20s has just gone to university, gotten a good job, and then three or four years later decides, you know what, I'm just going to do something completely different. I'm going to go back to school. A lot of parents would probably be like, uh, <clears throat> what? But, uh, so, he. one thing that is interesting is the schools that, that Matisse goes to to study painting were the top of the cream of the crop schools to study art at that time. So he studies at the Académie Julienne, which is... Uh, we've, we've talked about many different artists having attended this, this school over the years. And really, one of uh, one of the, the best painters of the time is uh, Bougereau. Let me see. I think I queued up. So this is the kind of painting that Bougereau was doing. Um, this kind of these very fanciful kind of. I, I think you know maybe that he would be considered a pre-Raphaelite kind of painter, which is this sort of period of art at the. Does it say anything about this style? Doesn't see anything of this, um, but realism. I would. I think he's. So there's this return. To, like while impressionism is happening, you have a, a kind of competing group of artists who are going back to the Renaissance and trying to do sort of neo Renaissance paintings, right? Because there's always seems to be in art the art world. There's one group of people doing one thing, and then another group that is reacting to that dominant. Uh, more popular style of painting and so Matisse's instructors were those people those those artists that that thought impressionism you know by Monet and Pissarro were just a passing fads and if anything just like sacrilege horrible art right so, so again here's another artist that Matisse studied with uh, Moreau who was Gustave Moreau who is a little bit of a quirky individual. So I think probably Moreau, even though like this is a very famous Moreau painting, uh, he, he did these... Moreau would be, I guess, compared as... The, he's sort of like the French William Blake, the, the painter and poet William... the British p poet and painter, in that he did all these very... <sighs> You can see here, you know, many of the surrealists saw Moreau as a uh, a proto surrealist painter. And there's, by the way, if you're ever in Paris, you've got to go visit the Gustave Moreau Museum studio, which is fantastic. It's a really cool. It's it that was turned into a museum before Moreau died. Moreau was a hugely influential, famous painter at the time. Probably not very well known here in North America at all, but in, still in France is considered to be one of the the, the greatest Frenchmen to ever live. So, um, and just a really cool studio. It's just jammed, packed. You can there's still some of the paintings that Moreau was working on in his studio the day he died. Um, anyway, uh, very cool little museum, kind of off off on the anyway. So those are those are the artists that Matisse studied with when he was when he was in school. And so we see here's some of the paintings that he was doing. We looked at briefly at some of this last yesterday, but you could see this very drab brown gray earthy tone palettes. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. Again, we, this is the particularly with Moreau Moreau's palette. Uh, and going for this more representational style of painting, which, you know, when you're a 25-year-old artist and your teachers are in their mid-60s and they're telling you that Impressionism, which is everywhere, whether it's... I mean, it was in the news because some people loved it and 
many critics hated it, it was pretty hard to ignore. So you'd be kind of like, I think there was a bit of uh, a, a, um, a conflict in inside Matisse's mind as to like, man, my teachers are saying that this whole impressionism stuff is just a fad. It's going to blow over in a few years, so don't play with it. But you can see even, you know, he's playing with with, with the the technical approach, the way that the, the impressionist painters painted, but still using the palette that his teachers were recommending. And then, you know, as soon as school is over with, he starts really playing with color. And that is sort of attributed to this um, meeting that he has with this Australian painter, John Russell, who was living in Paris um, and, well, kind of northern uh, Paris, or northern France at the time. And so Matisse visits this guy, who's, who's kind of a quirky fellow, and I think probably... You know, a hundred years ago in France, an Australian accent would have sounded really strange and super exotic to people. And uh, John Russell had known Vincent van Gogh, and he was a friend of some of the other Impressionist painters. And so there was this direct connection that uh, Matisse could have through a fellow like this and when they met. And upon leaving, uh, Russell gives Matisse one of Vincent Van Gogh's drawings, which would have just blown anyone's mind. I mean, Van Gogh at this point is now, you know, he's Van Gogh only died about four or five years before this moment. And Van Gogh's very quickly after he died starting to uh, become better and better known. It's so not nearly as famous as he was much later or today but his reputation is starting to kind of build and and pretty much from that moment Matisse his vision of what art should be is changed radically and all of that kind of classical approach to the painting goes out the window and Matisse dives into some of the impressionist concepts of of color theory which you know um one of the the, the, the so he he he, lear, he reads a, a few books on impressionist color theory, and this is really kind of one of the the dominant concepts, divisionism, which is really this idea of mixing. Um, uh, a, it, well, there's a number of just quickly, but essentially placing different colors side by side so that when we look at them our eye our brain merges them together into a third color which isn't actually physically present on the on the canvas but appears in our imagination or inside of our brains right essentially that's the way the printing press works with the bende dots right we've talked about this with when we did the roy lichtenstein painting and when we did our pointillist painting by Soro. so there's this is this p particular um approach to painting and that really sets off some bells for Matisse I think he just understands intuitively that that makes sense for the way that he wants to work so if we just sort of you know where we're so this is that era where he's um, he's gone back to school now he's a and graduated and he's now really experimenting with some of these divisionist impression neo impressionist impressionist um, uh, views on color and the color starts getting brighter brighter and the form Matisse's forms start to kind of collapse and fall apart a little bit there's that same sort of fuzziness that is kind of a key feature of impressionist painting that we see Matisse really experimenting with to the point where at times Matisse can be considered an abstract painter some of there's a number of Matisse paintings that are quite famous that are, um, you know, a very, that are held up by uh, abstract painters as sort of like how to do it. <laughs> um, so today's painting is, is from 1906, 1907. So it's really, so, and I should also say that right around 1904, 1905, Matisse, 
um, becomes sort of the figurehead of a new art movement called fauvism. Fauvism at one was really was a term coined by a critic to ridicule the art of Matisse and some of his fellow uh, artists that were painting in this vibrant style. And fauvism, um, or fauves, translates to like wild beasts, right? This idea that there were wild, out of control, you know, just like monkeys who are given paint and they're just splattering it and making a bunch of ugly, bright colors right out of the tubes. There's no classical approach to patient layering of colors. It's all wet on wet painting. Painting's done in a few hours rather than a few years, right? So 1904, we're going to see the colors really get, right, you can see, really get much more bright. Um, let me see. So this is, this is considered to be Matisse's first great masterpiece. And this also influences Picasso at the time. Picasso starts making a few paintings in response to this. And this is really the first time that Picasso and Matisse start being mentioned together in the same sentence, doing two totally different things and often positioned in opposition with one another. And yesterday I made the, the comparison between the Beatles and the Rolling Stones you know, we know today that the Beatles and the Rolling Stones are actually pretty good friends with one another. But as far as the press went, they they could be more antagonistic towards one another. Uh, and same sort of thing with Picasso and Matisse. Uh, I don't think they hated each other. I think they they there was a friendly rivalry, and I think there was you know at different times jealousy in between them. There were two pretty big you know, egotistical fellows, Matisse far less so than Picasso, but, but Matisse achieved a lot of success once, you know, these paintings, despite what some of the critics said, did sell relatively well, and Matisse was starting to be able to, to um, survive on his own selling these paintings, and dis uh, in fact, a lot of this early work was purchased by some very famous collectors in Russia. So a lot of these early Fauve paintings are in the collection of the Hermitage in, in Moscow uh, and the Pushkin Museum, as well as in France at the Musée d'Orsay, etc. So actually this up here, this is a painting we're going to be making on Thursday, the Green Line, which is a really probably the most famous painting of the whole Fauve period besides that uh, one I pointed out earlier here, where is it? Uh, Luxury, Calm, and Pleasure, which is actually, that's a pretty small painting, by the way. Okay, so, um, I, I guess if we just scroll down here, we'll get to today's painting. I think it's in. It'll be here somewhere. Yeah. So here we are. We'll talk about the really interesting um, swap of paintings Picasso and Matisse had because this is this painting is at the center of it. So let's let's do that as we get the painting begun here because we've got a little bit of work to to bring it up to speed. Okay. So. The next thing we're going to do is our underpainting, if we decide it's required. So let's take a look at the painting itself and just see. So an underpainting, oops, that's tomorrow's artwork, <laughs> uh, Matisse's jazz. Um, so underpainting, what that would be, would be to go over, let's say, some of these lines in the face particularly in order to help um, make them a little bit more visible because we are going to paint a little bit of uh, skin tone over here and if you've done your outlines a little bit lightly they might disappear so let's get some paint on the palette and then we'll start with our underpainting okay so we're going to use a little bit of white I'm going to use my special torture device here to squeeze out some paint. I love this thing. 
Okay, so when you think this tube of paint is empty, you use that little device. Whoa, that's way more <laughs> way more white than I'm ever going to need for today's painting, but I've, at least I've got it there. We'll see if there's something I can do at the end to use that paint. I'm going to put about as much paint on my palette as I put toothpaste on my toothbrush. I'm probably going to use most of these colors. I think I haven't really thought about it, so I'll put it put them all on here. Our the color we're going to use to make our underpainting a dark color is going to be used with warm red, cool blue, and cool yellow. So there we go. We've got all of our colors on here. So let's mix up our darkest color. So I'm going to take some warm red. Let's do this here. And cool blue. We could just use this exact color right here if we wanted. Because it's just going to get covered up anyway. So maybe I'll just do that. Maybe we'll just use this color. Because we just want something relatively dark that's going to kind of come through the white that we're going to put down here in a, in a few moments. So I'm just going to get... You know, sometimes rather than just wiping this brush right off and this this paint, I can still, I can use it sort of like a little palette. Um, so I don't have to worry about making this perfect. My goal is just to put this down so that future layers. I'll be able to at least see some of these um, marks. Okay. And then... This is also, you know, I know some people might think of this as like a make work thing. First of all, I think this can save you lots of time and frustration if you if you use this technique because now you don't have to kind of search for anything. Um, uh, but it's also a great way of just sort of warming up because if we make a mistake on this part here, it's we can cover it up completely and uh, we don't have to worry about, you know, it's just a great way of just getting a little bit of practice in before we actually start the painting. So I think that's, well, maybe let's do a, a, on her armpits here because that might also get covered, in fact. Okay. Here we go. So let's just see if we can get any of extra paint off here. And we'll wipe our brush off. Kathy says, hello everyone. I'm looking forward to this challenge. I can only stay for an hour. 
<laughs> well, hopefully you can get get the painting begun to get started. That's great. Dennis Prager says, this painting looks like a Doomer Wojak. I have no idea what that means. I don't know if that's something good or bad, grossly offensive, or something to aspire to. I have no idea. Lots of smiles in the chat. There's Natalie there. Uh, Robin. Okay. Oh, and Paula's there. Great to see you, Paula, as well. Kathy says, uh, yeah, he, he left law to become just a painter. Um, and Kathy Paula, or Ace is is Paula. Paula in, in, uh, on our Facebook group. That's, that's her name. So, which I don't think, I'm not giving anything away because Paula's been... <laughs> faithfully painting along with me for almost two years now. From the very beginning we started this, Paula is one of the very few people that, and, uh, again, AKA Ace, and one of the very few people that's been with me through this entire process, which is super exciting. Okay. Um, let's go to our background so we're gonna now paint the color that's gonna be in the background. And then while that's drying, we're gonna work on the foreground, which is the art, the Marguerite herself. And then we'll finish the background and then finish the foreground, as I've mentioned before. So the first thing we wanna do here is just think about like, how do we get this kind of color? So, Good question. There's a few different ways that we could do this. You know, we've already got our yellow here, so we can we can just um, kind of dirty this up with a couple of glazes. We could do some darker work and then put a glaze over top of it. So I think in any case, what we need is a, is a brown. We need to make a brown that we're going to kind of put around in here. And then I think we can apply that brown. And depending on how dark it actually appears when we're done, that might be fine. Or we might let it dry, work on the foreground, come back, and then just lighten it back up a little bit. So let's uh, let's mix a, uh, a brown. And since this is in the background, I'm gonna go for a little bit of a cooler brown just to help keep that background in the background. So to do that, I'm gonna take, let's take this uh, cool blue and cool yellow. Right, you're like, oh, that's uh, green. I thought we were doing brown. Ah. Don't go away just yet. So here we go. We're gonna take our cool red and mix that in here. Now that's kind of a bit of a, almost a bit of a grayish color. So let's let's get it back into a um, brown here. So I like this color. Now that's this is kind of like our the darkest color in in here. So it needs to be sort of modified, right? That color we see it in places in here. But if I just paint this right there, I'm just gonna make this way 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 too dark. So what we'll do is let's get. Let's do this down here. A bunch more of this yellow. And I'm going to put 
put a bit of matte medium here as well. It's going to help ensure that it's going to get a little bit thinner. So we're still going to have this kind of nice golden warm color coming through, but we're modifying it a little bit with this. I do feel like I need a bit more cool red. Okay, so let's just see how this works. We never know until we do it, so let's do it. Okay. And you can see there's some of the paint that's kind of coming off of my brush. Not really intentionally, but I don't mind that that's happening. Sometimes if that was to happen, that could be really upsetting because I'd be kind of smearing colors in here. But we see that there's, you know, um, a little bit of unevenness in the color in this painting as well. So what I, 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 I want to preserve the brush strokes. You see how we have all these brush strokes in here? I want to keep that. My goal is not to make a nice, solid, clean background here because that's not what we see in Matisse's painting. So I'm going to allow for these brush strokes to stay there. I just want to make sure that they're where I want them. So I, I'm pretty happy with this. Which that looks really. I'm just gonna darken. It's a little bit closer to the original. Okay, so I'm I'm pretty happy with this. I kind of want maybe a little bit more reddish in some areas. But you know what? I think I'm going to leave that. I think I'm going to leave this like that. And then let's paint this and get some color into the figure. Because I might say to myself, after I get a little bit of paint here, go like, whoa, that looks really dark. Or, oh, that looks way too light. i got to darken it. And so I, right, Because it's hard to see with this big yellow glowing form right in the center for me to ignore that and just to appreciate what I see around here my brain isn't that big so uh, that's why I like doing a little bit on the background working there setting that aside and then coming back to the foreground so that because uh, I always think of like a painting like a Polaroid right a, like when you make take a Polaroid picture it's not like the background completely uh, fades in and only then do the faces come in everything is fading in simultaneously so I want that to happen in my paintings I want the background to slowly appear with the foreground and sorry I don't know if I mentioned um, but the fluid that I put in here to thin out this uh, brown was matte medium and so I use matte medium sometimes more or less depending on the paintings we're doing so that just is it's transparent paint it's it's paint that has no color no pigment in it and so it can be really really helpful for making slightly thinner uh, more transparent colors okay so before I move on, I just want to make sure that this underpainting, these lines are dry. 
What should we do first? Maybe let's do the face. We'll mix the skin tone, and then we'll uh, do the hair, and then her clothes. So again, let's move this out of the way. When it, you hold, touch a rag and it is it gets your hands dirty rather than cleans them, that's when you know that rag has outlived its purpose for the moment anyway. Let's get another brush here. So to make a skin tone, we can. there's all sorts of different ways to make a skin tone, but we, we want this face to be in the foreground. So we want to have a warm brown. Here we made a cool brown which wants to recede into the background, right? In the episode when we talked about warm and cool colors, we talked about how warm colors come towards us, cool colors advance away from us, right? And when I say us, I mean the viewer, right? And you can be a viewer when you're viewing your own painting, right? So that warm color wants to rise and the cool color goes backwards. So we put our cool brown in the background now we're going to put our warm brown in the foreground, right? And even though this, you might not think this is a brown, basically it's, it's a brown with a lot of white in it, right? So to make that color, let's start with some warm yellow and a little bit of warm red. Maybe that's a little bit much. So we make an orange. Right. And then I'm going to take my warm blue. I'm, I don't need much blue at all, so I'm going to put a little bit off to the side. And then we just mix this together. So we get a, a very kind of like sandy brown color. Okay. Now we're going to take some white and mix this together. And that's pretty close to the color we want. Um, I think I might need just a little bit more red in there to make it just a little bit more pink. I mean, very, very small amount. I think that's that's it right there, right? So again, I used mostly warm yellow, let's say like 70% warm yellow, 25% warm red, 5% warm blue. Mixed it together and then just added white and then just added mostly probably some a little bit of red to kind of make it just a little bit pinker. Now it's not quite the color I have in my hand, but my colors on my hand is not exactly what it looks like in the Matisse's either, right? So, if in doubt, you know, a couple good thing to do is just paint an area where maybe right not on the middle of the face, but maybe a little bit elsewhere, and just see how that turns out. And I'm pretty happy with that. Okay. I'm just going to paint right over everything, and you can see why putting that color or underpainting in there was helpful, right? It preserved those lines because we're, there's a lot of white in here, and that white is used, is great for covering up mistakes. Okay. Oh, a little bit of this neck here. Don't forget that. So the face is still there. It's just now covered with this color. And at the moment, this looks like I've I've got it pretty good. 
I'm not I'm not willing to bet my entire life savings that it's exactly like the color on the left. I mean, we could Oops. Let's see if we, just as a experiment here if we get them. You see they're not exactly the same. That's what I was saying. So, you can see the one on the left is a little bit darker a little bit more blue in it than what I have and it's once I got it closely I could see a few little patchy areas so I just want to make sure those are covered hmm okay anyway we've got that so let's back it out again and then how about let's uh I'm gonna clean this brush off <laughs> Laurie says oh darn I'm late I was gonna paint along but was working on another painting what happens to time yes it just disappears sometimes quickly, especially when you're painting. And oh man, do I I'm always have that like, whoa, I, how, where did, I, I thought I just started this and two hours goes by and, um, so, you know, let's look at the hair, I think, let's, because that way we can work our way top down. So, I see some pretty cold green underneath this and actually now that I look at it it looks like these lines have a bit of a greenish quality too so potentially the, the color that we make for the hair I think there's two colors we've got our a kind of a cold green and then he's darkened it maybe with a, uh, a bit of warm blue we'll see we'll, we'll, we'll mix a few things and see how close we can get but well, let's start out with this cold um, blue, or cold uh, green here. So I mean, I've used up all of my cold blue, so let's just put a bit back here. So let's take our cold yellow, let's mix it over here. And our cold blue. We'll mix these together. So we're going for these saturated colors underneath there. So mixing cold yellow and cold blue is going to get us this as really bright emerald color. Oops, maybe not so much more blue. I think that's pretty. That's almost, maybe that's actually, actually, let's put a little bit more of this cold blue in here. Just, I don't want it to be too candy colored, right? But this kind of color, that really bright green, we see that in a lot of Matisse's paintings of this time, particularly. So, you know, it might seem kind of like, whoa, what on earth are we doing? This putting green in her hair like this? That's crazy. What is she, punk rocker or something? Well, this goes into what Matisse's whole approach to painting is all about. Is these really saturated, bright colors. And then modifying them or putting other colors next to them which appears to modify that color when it hits our eye. So, you know, if you were to ask a hundred people on the street right now, what colors is her hair? Probably a lot of people would say brown or black. And yes, that's what the color ultimately does look like, but that's not how it was painted. That's not the actual color that's there, 
right? Which is kind of mind-boggling that we can use a green like this and in a few steps further, most people won't actually see a green here at all. They're gonna see a completely different color. Okay. Cool. So now let's zoom back out here and just take a look at her clothes down here. Now this is a bit of a, a, a colder Prussian blue kind of, which I think is it's maybe a cobalt or Prussian blue which are really almost right in the middle of the color wheel, right? Or kind of between the two blues, I mean. So, there's two ways we could go about this. One way we could paint this a cold blue right now, and then we could put a warm blue over top of it or we could try to mix this color. My only fear is if I, I think I might have to do two layers here. Let's just see if I put some That's right, just was testing. That warm, that's, that's my cool blue, I mean. Okay, what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna, do I, which is my, this is my original, color, my dark color. So let's, I'm gonna take this dark color, I'm gonna add to it and turn it into a gray. So remember, this is the color we used to do all of my underpainting. This was cool blue, warm red, and now I'm adding cool yellow to it. And in doing so, I'm gonna get a grayish color eventually. Right now it still looks quite brown. And that tells me that there's yellow and red and we need more blue in here. And boom, we put that blue in and we start getting a nice gray color. So this is going to be a nice dark color that we can use to add some value to darken down our blue. So let's also, let's, where should we do this? Let's take this cool blue and let's mix it over here. I'm going to take a bit of warm blue as well. Ooh, there you go. You see that's that's the color and I so I had my a little bit of my dark color it was basically kind of like a really dark gray my co mostly cool blue and a little bit of, of warm blue and then we get that cobalt color which exists right between them now I think I just need a bit more paint I don't want to run out halfway through so let's just mix a bit bigger batch of this so I'm going to take again my cool blue My warm blue and that gets us in between those two blues and then our dark color my only fear is this is gonna get really dark when I paint this so because I'm if I paint directly onto this yellow I'm afraid that the yellow is going to mix into this color and make it go gray. Because we're, we're going to pull that blue right into the middle. Um, so this this would be an instance, and I don't, I'm not going to do this because I don't want to confuse anybody, but just for the more advanced painters out there, 
This would be an instance where you might want to consider using a zinc white uh, or might be called transparent mixing white because what this type of white does is it, unlike titanium white, right? Here's our two whites. And again, I, I really hesitate to even mention this. So if you're just a beginner, just plug your ears for a second. But so typically what we're using is our titanium white for doing everything. But this would be an instance where you're using a zinc white or again, or um, transparent mixing white would be good because it's not going to tint that color quite as much. Um, but I'm... Let's, um, I'm going to take a bit of it, just a little bit of white, and where should we do this? Okay. So I'm going to take a little bit of this and paint this. So this has got a bit of the white in here, just to lighten it up block out a little bit of that yellow and then I'm going to paint it in its regular full strength over top of this. So if I use the zinc white I'd probably be able to do this all in one pass without doing it twice but Um, that's just that's a video that I plan on making next month about different whites. So I just I don't want to introduce that concept too much right now because I don't want to confuse anybody. But Lolly's here, John's here, all the crew is back together. That's great. <laughs> okay, so here's, um, let's actually, let's blow dry that just to set that um, so that when I paint the darker blue over top of it, it's not going to get uh, wiped away. But this gives you an idea what it looks like. And actually, I think it's going to be kind of nice. It's going to give it a nice little glow. Okay, so I'm just going to mute the, the microphone for a moment. Okay, so now I'm going to paint this color over top, and I'm just wondering if I should do it with this little brush. I think I will. I, I'm actually also going to put just a little bit of matte medium in here just to make it a little bit more transparent. That's going to keep it from getting too dark, but also I, I like this color that we've just applied here with that white in there, and I kind of want to preserve a little bit of it. I want to keep that bit of that warm, or that, it's a little bit more of a coolish glow, so I'm just hoping that this will help that a little bit. Okay. And the thing is, too, you know, if you put in too little of this matte medium, or it's it's not quite dark enough, because this has definitely made it not nearly as dark as it would have been, then you can always just do a second coat of it, and it's just going to get darker. Right? You could see how much, you know, more 
bright this is right now. So I'm just going to try to go with these brush strokes. Hmm. Do I want... I mean, I like that color. Do I want it to go uh, darker? That's the question. I think I'm going to think about it. Let that sit there and dry, and let's work on her hair now. So let's come back up to the top here. And um, let's take care of that. Actually, let's just clean this brush off so I don't it doesn't uh, harden on me while we're working elsewhere here. So now we've done the background, or at least a pass on the background, or a pass on the foreground. So maybe even let's let's think about the background. Do we need to do anything, or do we want to do anything more to it? Are we happy with it at this point? So let's take a look. Let's, maybe let's compare them side by side. You know, this looks a little bit brighter. I'm pretty confident that I've nailed it. Um, if anything, mine's got a bit more of a warmer, or not warmer, a bit more of a reddish quality. Whereas his has a bit more of a bluey, green or greenish brown. So that would have, that's just a small amount of more red, cool red than cool blue. I don't mind this, although I would say that at this point, I, I part of me wants to lighten it up a little bit, um, or add a little bit more, maybe red in here. But I don't know. I think I'm gonna leave it. I think I think I'm just gonna leave the background like this. I know it's. Uh, yeah, so so if that's the case then, then let's um, let's go instead back to the foreground, right? So so that simplifies things a little bit, right? So if we want to do the foreground, then let's look at. Uh, finishing off her hair and then we could start doing the outlining and then do we want to do anything to the clothes down here so I think what we need to do is deal with this hair because I don't know about you but looking at the hair this green hair it might even be influencing the way I think about the background right so it potentially when we do this I might go oh yeah, we need to lighten that background. Now the background definitely looks too dark, but I don't know. So let's, uh, if we look at the original, let's just see if we can suss out what this dark color is. Now this could just be the way it's printed or way it was photographed, but this color definitely has a greenish quality. I mean, it kind of looks like what happens to a Sharpie. You know, if you draw with a Sharpie and and on a piece of paper and let it sit near a window, that Sharpie's gonna go kind of purple or green as it fades. So I think we could probably use some of this green that we used earlier and just darken it down. So we just, we're gonna see what, let's see what we can get if we take our dark color and mix it into this green so we get a really dark green I'm 
gonna put a bit of warm blue in here. A bit more. The reason I'm putting the warm blue in there, first of all, is because I want these lines to sit right on top. Um, but uh, let's see. Let's take a bit more of cool yellow. Hmm. Cool yellow, and let's take more of this warm blue. Do I like that? That's the question. I think we're pretty close. Let's take, I'm gonna take all the rest of this warm blue. My only fear is if I darken this down here, this might be actually the color I use for the clothes down there. Let me just see. Hmm. Now that I do that, I think we're, I think I'm going to be okay. Let's let's try it. The only way we can know for sure is if we start painting with it, and the painting will tell us pretty quickly whether we've made the right decision or not. So let's put these side by side. get a, a kind of smaller square brush right, the, the, that's my pinky finger there because I'm going to come in around here so yeah, let's take just a smaller brush to get into I, I mean, right now, I like how that looks. That that I think is pretty close. Not exactly sure, but uh, it's hard still. You know, all that green. So I'm doing the kind of the, the lines that I see in her hair, which are very subtle. And then I'm going to darken everything over top of this, hopefully to preserve just a little bit of this detailing in the hair.
Okay, and while I'm here, let's try doing a little bit of this using the same color on the face. Now, one thing, see my paintbrush, there's all this paint that's accumulated there. What I like to do is just wipe that off because um, sometimes that just, it falls off or gets globby or makes it hard to see exactly what you're doing. So just wipe that off. I'm just wondering about painting the whites of her eyes, actually, just before I go too much further here. Uh, I'm going to take a little bit of white. So, actually, let me just show, show you what I'm doing here. So I'm taking a little bit of white. And this was that skin tone that I had earlier. I'm just going a little bit into it. I don't want a pure, pure white because no one's eyes are actually pure white. That's going to look m more than white enough. In fact, I might even feel like that's too white. Like it's not white, but compared to everything else, it looks white. All right, so... That's, you know, color can be really deceiving that way. Okay. This, this color looks maybe a little bit more blue. Now, like I see, it looked fine up here. Now here it looks maybe a little bit more blue than I would have liked, at least in, in comparison. But let's, I'm gonna continue painting it and then we'll see. Maybe I'll be totally happy with it by the time I'm done. I don't know. So I'm not gonna make any judgments just yet. Looks like he painted this and then went over top of it with red as I just look at it right now. So let's paint this in and we'll see if we can do that.
interesting what he does here is that line gets it sort of disappears and he lets this oh, okay so I should have noticed that a little bit more carefully as I was painting it but that is that's pretty cool I like how that line disappears in there huh You can see that now that I have this color here, look how much different this skin tone looks like from the original. Right? That's kind of the weird thing with color. Is the and this is exactly what that whole divisionism concept is, is the color changes when we put different colors next to them. Now we're obviously we're gonna do a little bit more here on these faces. Or on this face. There's only one here. Um but uh, just not quite there yet. Okay. So let's zoom back out. So, I mean, obviously we need, we're going to darken the hair here in a moment. But I'm pretty happy with this. In fact, I could probably take the same color and just uh, using glazing fluid or um, matte medium do a little glaze over that. Maybe even down here. Let's do that. Let's just see how that turns out. Okay, so maybe I'll just back out a little bit more. We see the full painting there. Okay, I think I'm just going to blow dry all of this here. Okay, let's sip a tea. Um, I'm just debating, do I want to use glazing fluid or matte medium? They do the same thing. How about for, I'm going to use uh, matte medium because usually I use glazing fluid for this kind of thing but since this is a beginner class let's I want to show you that we can do all of this with maybe just one medium 
because maybe not everyone went and got all of the mediums. And really, the only two mediums I think you you need to do any acrylic painting are matte medium and glazing fluid. There was a period of time for a few months where I was using the slow dry medium a lot, and then kind of since. You know, sometimes you just go through a period of time where you really like the effects of one particular medium. So, um, yeah. So let's take this matte medium. Oh, that was more than I was planning, but that's actually not bad because let's take this. So I'm basically thinning this paint out quite quite a lot. And right now it's going to look kind of, it might even look like I'm lightening things up until this dries. So actually let's take a bit of the darker color Is that going to go too dark? Hmm. Let's compare these side by side. confusing when you see that the white of the not it, it appears white the um, from the matte medium but that's gonna dry and disappear that gets us much closer to the original let's do this as well with the hair and go in here I don't want to cover up all of this green I want to leave maybe just little bits of it so let's zoom in I can still see all those lines in there. They're just getting darker. I think I need to do this again a second time. Right on camera, we can still see that there, there's still a lot of that there. So I'm going to mute it and blow dry again. <laughs> and we've got Tanya here. Okay, let's continue there. Got a lot of 
cheeky people here today. <laughs> Goofing around in the chat about being late and in detention. Again, what I love about doing this kind of thing is we can just go nice and slow, whatever kind of feels right, without cover. Whatever we want to cover, we can just do this very slowly. Is that enough? Do I need, should I go in a third time through here? I think that might, I think I, I, it's hard to say, right in there. So I want to preserve a little bit of the green, but I almost, I want that to be kind of one of those things that people see only if they look close enough. I think that's good. And I think the for clothes, if we zoom back out, I think we've got that pretty good. I could go a little bit darker. This is still maybe a little bit bright. But at the moment I kinda like the way that looks. So I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that. What I want to do is I want to introduce uh, some lipstick and a little bit of the rouge on her cheeks. Okay. So actually, let's look at this a little bit closer and just see. Is that okay so we could see there this is definitely a magenta in here there might be both reds but I think we could probably just get away with one just considering how small this is so um, let's see I've got this is my cool red on its own, that might be a little intense. So I'm gonna take a bit of my darker color. And again, use that. And that gets us much closer. All right? Because if we put that, that cool red as it is on here, it might just look really silly. Oops, what is... I can see that already that actually looks too bright, so I'm actually mixing a bit of my darker color in there. Painting right over all of those dark lines.
So now let's get a bit of just a really light rouge quality on those cheeks. And so that rouge is, a, is instead of this cool red, it's going to be a warm red. So I'm going to take this um, matte medium that I had before. Oops, so there's uh, I have to get. No, that's, that won't do. It's got blue in it. I thought I could get away with it because I had a bunch of extra. You know what? I'm, I am going to use glazing fluid for this. Matte medium is just uh, not the best for this specific activity. So I'm going to use... This matte, or sorry, yeah, matte glazing fluid, satin glazing fluid, and let's just put a bit. bit of this. You don't need much of it. It's always best just to, to do it when you're doing any of this kind of glazing to start really light. Okay, and I'll also get another brush I have a specific brush for this, but just for our purpose, I'm just going to use just a regular brush to just kind of brush it around. So that's not enough. Let's get a bit more red on here. very subtle. It looks a little bit darker on my side, but we'll have to do it again anyway. So super thin, and I want this brush to be as dry as possible. So it doesn't quite, it's not quite there yet. One more coat of this and I'm convinced it's going to look much better. Okay, so what we need to do is blow dry this. Do this again. So we should, let's put them side by side here. And just sort of brush out the sides.
Um, I, I, I mean, again, I, I think mine, it's, I'm having a weird thing with the color the last few episodes, because that looks, in, in person, this looks pretty close to, to what I see, but when I see them side by side on the screen, all of a sudden it changes a little bit, and it's possible that that's, that's, that's just all in my head, but it's also, I know that I did color correct these, so I'm actually pretty happy with this. I think the last thing I want to do is I'm going to darken all, many of these lines, and then we'll be done. So... Okay, so we're now just going to do the, the little finishing touches, do a little bit of outlining, and then I'm, I'm going to be really happy because we're, we're going to finish in pretty good time today. I shouldn't say that because you never know, but I feel pretty good that, that we're, we're on track here. So every time I say I'm almost done, it's like I somehow managed to have an extra hour of work to do, but I think... We'll be fine here. So let's zoom out. And um, I think I'm gonna mix my dark color again because this is what it was, but I don't know, something funny happened. So I think I need a little bit more cool blue. Let's do this right over here. My, oh, here's all my brushes in there. Let's use this one. Okay. I'm going to take my warm red and cool blue. We'll mix those together. And then we'll take some cool yellow as well. We could just use black if we wanted, um, but I always like making my own dark color, especially for an intro painting class, just to show people how to do that. Okay, there we go. That's the color that I want as my darkest color. And also Matisse didn't use black in this painting. It looks, if there's, yeah, I mean, maybe the collar, that might be black. And you know, one of the central tenets of Impressionism is trying not to use black if possible because of how kind of intense of a color and dominant the color is. So it wouldn't surprise me if there was, if he didn't use black at all. Or at least, I know Matisse did use black on certain occasions for sure, but just that's, I mean, in this particular painting at this point in his life. I'm just going to blow dry everything just so that now I'm going to be doing like the writing so I don't stamp my hand all over the place here. says I can definitely see some of Matisse's underpainting especially right now um, it's not as flat as it initially appears and that's definitely yes absolutely that's one of the qualities of Matisse is I think he really liked the idea of things being deceptively difficult um, more or more complex than first like if, there's definitely some people that might look or might have looked at his paintings and said, ah, it's my kid could do that kind of thing. 
To which I'm sure he would be like, fine, great. That's fine. I'm glad I found that out because I don't want to sell my painting to somebody that thinks like that. And then, you know, there would be the, the people that did appreciate the work and, and notice things that you're talking about, um, Tanya, is I think that's what he was going for. He wanted to kind of, so almost like a test to see who's really paying attention. I'm also going to go back over top of this hair and just and some of the other lines in the face and just darken those as well. Not every aspect of it. get to a mistake in good time you can wipe it away so let's zoom in a bit here So I'm kind of emphasizing a little bit of this uh, pattern in the hair that, you know, you don't have to do this, but this is just something that I see in the painting that I like that I'm sort of going to the, I'm amplifying.
So with this darker color, I'm not gonna go over everything in, so I'm probably gonna do the top eyelid and the eye, and then we'll just see if that's enough. out and power comes back on I'll just leave the the bottom eyelid for now. We'll take a look in a moment. Let's do the nose. Again, I'm going to leave the bridge of the nose. Do the line between the lips. might leave the rest of the face here. Let's do... that hair. Let's do... collar. Her necklace. So we're getting some highlights where it's the paint's still wet, but as that dries, that will go away. A little bit longer. Okay. And then we have That's actually much lighter color now that I just did it. Um, yeah, 
should have, maybe. Hmm, okay, so let's take a bit of this um, matte medium just to go in here and maybe make this not quite as solid of a line. that you know these that still looks like maybe like it could get a little bit darker but I don't mind it right the, like that personally and the blush on her cheeks could get even darker don't also mind the way that I've done it. It's pretty subtle on my side of things. Um, let me think. Tanya says, I'm having such a hard time mixing my own black, right? So warm red cool blue and a little bit of cool yellow should get you there. You could also use cool warm blue, warm yellow and cool red to do that or I mean I've never I would assume that would work I have to think about that but um, so just my little finishing touches cheeks even more red I think I'm I think I could live I'm happy with that So what I'm doing is there was just those ridges where the texture of the paint was pretty severe. So I'm just kind of smudging them out, pressing them out, like kind of popping a zit, I guess, to kind of get them a little lay, a little bit more flat because even after they dry, they're, that's still going to catch the light, maybe in a way that I'm not so pleased with. So, okay. So... Um, other things I could do, which I'm not going to do. Well, let's let's get there in a second. Let's. 
Let's do our side-by-side -side comparison here. We'll talk about things. Okay, so... Um, Oh, okay. So just before we wrap up, just a few reminders to take a picture of the artwork that you created and share it to the private Facebook group. And if you want some feedback, then once a month, I'll take a look at the artwork that you guys have created and give you some free feedback, right? You don't have to donate anything, do anything other than just load it to the Facebook group. That would be great to see what you're up to, whether you've been painting Matisse's portrait of his daughter, Marguerite, or if you're working on something else, right? So obviously like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. And if you want to leave a small donation, as little as a dollar, there's the PayPal. You can send a check or e-transfer by contacting me through my website or the Facebook group as well. Okay, so let's take a look at these two side by side and determine what we think. Okay. So I'm pretty satisfied, especially for going, you know, this is a, maybe a little bit more, there's more going on in this painting that may occur to people at first, right? And, um, you know, I could have spent a little bit more time in the background adding just a little bit more nuance, like there's some blues around in here, you can see. Um, the, the color of the skin tone is maybe a little bit more nuanced than what I've got. And we can see where he also painted some lines uh, as part of an underpainting process. Let's say on this side of the bridge of the nose that has been covered over in his painting. I obviously just omitted that entirely because he used that as part of trying to figure out how to actually make this painting. Um, maybe the whites of my eyes are still too white, so I could do a little bit of glazing and just darken them down ever so slightly. That's another little thing. Um, you know, the, and I think those would be the, or maybe the blush could be a little bit darker, but I like the way it appears. And the same thing, the hair could also be a little bit darker to disguise you know, to make it a little bit more of a solid shape, whereas like, you can see a little bit of my line work inside, but I, that's just my own personal style in there. Okay, so um, I think for our purpose, that takes us to the conclusion of today's episode, everybody. Um, I hope you enjoyed working on this painting with me, and I, I'm excited to see how yours turned out. I I'm, I'm, wouldn't be surprised if it looks a little bit different than mine, as every painting sometimes does. But um, uh, it's certainly achievable for even a beginner artist. And you can even make it even more simple, if you like. Okay, everyone, we'll see you tomorrow. We're going to paint Matisse's Jazz. We're going to do a cutout for those. I'm going to paint a regular painting and do it as a cutout. So we'll do two versions of the same painting in tomorrow's episode this is the very famous jazz poster so that's going to be a lot of fun really bright solid colors so stick around for that one tomorrow otherwise we'll see you guys again then enjoy your evening everyone and we'll talk to you again soon good night Thank you.